Welcome to Lingthusiasm, a podcast that is enthusiastic about linguistics. I'm Lauren Gorn. And I'm Gretchen McCulloch. And today, we're talking about how nothingness fits into language. But first, we're very excited to announce the location for our live show, thanks to meeting our latest goal on Patreon, which we announced first in the bonus episode, and now you get to find out here. So our last live show was in Gretchen's hometown of Montreal, and we decided it's only fair that our next official show means that I get to repay the favour, and so we're going to have it in my hometown of Melbourne. I'm so excited to get to go to Australia. I have never been to Australia before. I'm so excited to show you around Melbourne when you come to visit. I want to see a kangaroo. Maybe not in Melbourne. I hear they're not super urban. <laughs> That's okay. We have zoos. You'll you'll get to see kangaroos. Okay. Okay. Or like, this is important. Uh, I'm also very excited to be going to the Centre of Excellence for the Dynamics of Language Summer School in Canberra and the annual Australian Linguistic Society Conference in Adelaide, where I'm going to be talking about linguistics communication, doing workshops there. And if anyone else in Australia who's listening to this wants to invite me to something, now's your chance. We will have more details about the date and location of the live show. It should be sometime in November, and hopefully some other events that we can do while we have Gretchen in the country. I'm super excited to spend a bunch of time there. I'm sure the weather will be much nicer than Montreal in November. I'll get all the sunshine. And yeah, looking forward to meeting a bunch of Australian linguists. The live show is all thanks to our amazing patrons who support us on Patreon. Our latest bonus episode for them was an inside view into the conference circuit. Gretchen and I caught up about what we've been up to over the last couple of months of conferencing. That episode is available on patreon.com slash lingthusiasm. So you can hear about the two different emoji conferences that I went to and the Gesture Conference and the International Congress of Linguists that Lauren went to, as well as 17 previous bonus episodes, which is quite a lot of bonus material if you go to Lingthusiasm on Patreon. Today, we're going to talk about nothing, and it's going to be great. Actually, this whole episode is just us not saying anything. The rest of it is just silence. I don't think we're actually capable of doing that. (laughs) I'm just going to put it out there. (laughs) This is like the John Cage 433 version of Lingthusiasm, where you put us both ambiently in a room and you're just like, we don't say anything. Eventually we just start giggling. No, defy science. It's not going to happen. And the thing is, there's so much to say about nothing because nothing is incredibly meaningful. That's the thing. There is so much to say about nothing. Do you want to start with pauses? Yes, we are going to start with, we're going to move through different kinds of meaningful nothingness in language and what they can tell us about kind of how meaning works and how brains work. But I want to start with pauses and their importance for conversation. And pauses are actually kind of rare. How rare is rare? Like, does that mean just like one person talks a lot and so you can't get a word in edgewise? Well, I think as English speakers, we have this idea that words are separated by pauses because we have spaces between words to indicate their boundary in written text. But when we speak, there's there's no margin between. You can't look at a recording spectrogram and see breaks between every word. It's all just run together in a single string. Yeah, so there's not really pauses between words. And then even between when one person talks, another person talks, there's often not that much pausing, right? There's actually so little pausing in some interactional, in in many interactional contexts, that it is too short for the brain to actually really have prepared for it without doing some clever anticipation about how that person's speech goes and, and how interaction goes. So the average time between me saying something and someone replying is like 200 milliseconds, which is like the speed of a blink. That's really not that much. No. It turns out that we're just basically all constantly ready to reply to someone as soon as they have something to say. And we're constantly trying to like predict where the pauses are. Um, I was reading this paper about conversation analysis, and it said that even if you get up to like, you know, 500 milliseconds of a pause, like if I say, hey, Lauren, how's it going? And then you wait for 500 milliseconds, which again is like half a second. If you don't say anything in that 500 milliseconds, I'm going to be like, did you understand me? Are you there? I'm going to be rephrasing the question like, no, seriously, what's up? Is there a problem? Or in the case that I run into in Montreal with French, 
if you don't reply in that 500 milliseconds, people think you don't speak the language, and so they'll switch languages. Yeah. So a lot of data that I've been looking at for this comes from Nick Enfield's book, How We Talk, which I reviewed a while ago and really enjoyed, and I'm excited to get to talk about it again. Because, yeah, like half a second we don't think of as being very long, but in a conversation that is ages yeah, it's so long. And this is the eternal bane of the language learner, because you're like, no, 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 I'm just taking that extra like half second to figure out what you're saying and prepare my response. But because you can't quite do that, that's one of the things that like trips people up, makes it hard to speak in another language. Which, if you can figure out how to fill that pause with like the right filled pause sound, like if you say uh or uh or different sounds, like depending on the language, what you what you say in pauses, sometimes that could be enough to like let your brain recover but stay in the language. Yeah, you're like, wait, wait, I've got something. I'm just processing, not that I'm ignoring you. And interestingly, if you take longer to reply, it often indicates that you're going to say a no. We're very mm. quick to say yes. And in a conversation, the silence before a no is often longer. And it's a way of signaling very subtly to the person you're talking to that they're probably not going to get the answer they want. Yeah, that's a good point. There's another thing that's really neat, which is our brains are also very good at kind of faking lack of pauses, even when there is one. So when you talk to someone on Skype or on other kinds of internet video chat, Skype often has a little little bit of a time delay between you, but you generally don't really notice that. So a way you can notice that time delay, if you're talking to someone on Skype, is try counting together. So if you try counting like one, two, three, four, five in synchrony. Or if you try singing a song together, you'll discover that one person is on an apparent time delay, or you're both on an apparent time delay to each other, <laughs> because you're not actually hearing the person as instantly as you think you are. And we cope with the transitions. Our brains just kind of do a little mental shift. Yeah, it doesn't seem to bother us that much. People talk a lot about how this varies a lot between cultures. Mm. And one of the studies from Nick's book looks at the variation in turn taking in conversation across 10 languages and finds that sure there, there is variation in the average amount of time it takes but that all of them are actually kind of fall within on average that half a second 500 millisecond boundary and that the variation isn't as massive as we think it is it just feels very important because we're very sensitive to that short amount of time yeah and you can also get kind of pseudo pauses in written text right well, it's so necessary to like, because we can just read text at this kind of constant blur, you have to force it to have the breaths and the space that you want to convey that are very easy to do in spoken language and require some extra tools in written language. Yeah, I think of this especially in text chat. Like if you're talking on, you know, Gchat or WhatsApp or iMessage or Facebook chat or any of the different kinds of instant chat platforms. And like every time you put in a, a new message or a new line break, it's kind of like adding in a pause. Yeah. I find it very stressful when people send whatever their contribution to the conversation is as one giant paragraph of text. Oh, I'm yeah. very much a, like split it all up, Let's keep it rolling. Unless it's like the first message, because then you didn't even know they were messaging you. True. But if you just see the like is typing indicator for like five minutes, you're like, oh my God, what is this person trying to say? <laughs> Something exciting, hopefully. Um, I also like a good ellipsis when you want to, like, when you really, it's not just this, like, brief turn-taking pause. It's that you really want to, like, emphasize that you're uh, thinking about something. Yeah, that you want to kind of link two things together and send them at the same time, but also put a pause in between them. Yeah. So you can put the dot, dot, dot. An even more subtle but more torturous form of pause in chat and messenger is when you have the option to show someone that you've read their message but you haven't replied. Mm. I find those kind of chat apps very stressful. And it really, I mean, it, it's just a reminder that even though we think of online chat as being the same as face-to-face -face chat, and often we use it in that kind of immediate I say something, you say something way, it is still not synchronous. It's an asynchronous form of communication. If, I, if you said something or asked me a question and then I went away for a week and then replied, face to face, it is like impossible. <laughs> <laughs> That's really weird. Yeah. <laughs> but you can like, you can leave someone on read in chat or in text messages. And it's like, there are aspects of it that are weird, but there are aspects of it that are maybe less weird, you know? And it's mostly just very stressful or irritating if you are banking on a reply. 
I mean, normally it happens to me if like someone messaged me like overnight and I check it first thing in the morning, but I'm not quite awake yet, and then I kind of forget. I don't have the energy to type mm, anything yet. It's dangerous. Like, <laughs> like you message me from Australia, and it's like, oh yeah, here let's let this this thing, and then like later in the day, I'm like, wait a second, Lauren sent me a message. I should reply to that. <laughs> And it's always the person who started the interaction or is waiting for the reply always has more invested than the person who's not replying. Although I don't feel so bad because you're always asleep anyway when I wake up, so. <laughs> that is true. Asynchronous communications works very well when you live asynchronously. That's true. Another type of nothing and pause that I really like is when you can put a pause, a teeny tiny micro pause, in the middle of a word or to use it as a part of the sounds that are going to create a word. So this is no longer part of the kind of turn-taking, conversational cut and thrust. This is part of the sounds that might make up the alphabet of a language. Like, what if pausing is just another letter of the alphabet? And this is true in a number of languages. And it's also true in some languages that don't so much put in the alphabet, but still integrate into the words. So in the English word, uh-oh, you can't just say uh-oh. You can say, oh, it just means something weird and different. Because <laughs> that's, like, not the same thing as, uh-oh. It is not the same thing, no. <laughs> right. Well, it's not the same thing as, uh-oh, and, oh. And so the pause in the middle of, uh-oh, even if it's a very tiny, uh-oh, pause, or you could say, uh-oh, that could be a longer pause, but that pause is doing something that's yeah. working on it at the word level, because, oh, does not feel like the same word. And so there are a bunch of different sounds that are produced by blocking the flow of air coming out of the mouth. So if you say like b or p or t or k, those are all produced by creating that blockage with your lips or with your tongue and then letting the air puff out. And you can tell that it's a stop because you can really extend that. So you could go a p or a d or a and it's really weird because we obviously don't hold a G for that long when we're saying a word. But to hold it and then you see that it's like everything has stopped, nothing's going forward. Exactly. And so that's, you know, some sounds don't do that. So if you say ooh or if you say s, you can hold on to an ooh or a s as long as you have breath to spare. Yeah. But for p or b or k, it's the closure and it's the release of that closure or the release of that stop that makes the sound really happen. And if you hold a K for like extra long, like a K, that's just an extra period of silence. I didn't realize you were making a noise that I thought you just paused. <laughs> <laughs> that's the thing, right? Like I knew that there was this blockage of air happening in my throat, but like you can't hear that because like nothing's coming out. Yeah. So one of the things that we're doing constantly and not really thinking about is creating these kind of mini blockages. But the biggest of those blockages is the one that happens in uh-oh, which is known as a glottal stop because it's produced with the glottis or the voice box, the vocal cords. And so rather than pause the airflow at your lips or at your tongue, where maybe you can still kind of squeak a little bit of air by, or you can still do other stuff with your mouth to kind of control the air as it's coming out, if you block off the flow of air in your throat... You can't do anything else with your vocal cords. You can't do anything else with your nose. You can't do anything else with your tongue at the same time. You're really just kind of blocking off air in its purest form. Nothing is happening. Like, nothing is escaping. And if you really want to see what that looks like, thankfully we don't have to cut people open anymore. <laughs> um, we have some really great videos in the show notes that show people saying these sounds in an MRI machine. Um, it's pretty amazing if you click on the little glottal stop yeah, it's pretty spectacular. And English uses this sound in uh-oh, and uh-oh is kind of one of those things that's like dubiously a word. It's kind of a word, but it's also kind of just like one of those sounds that you make. It's not a sound in our alphabet. We don't have like A, B, C, <laughs> E, F, G. But there are languages that have this sound, the glottal stop, as just a regular sound in their alphabet. One of them is Hawaiian. Mm. So if you have the name Hawaii, but in Hawaiian it's pronounced Hawaii, and the apostrophe that's written in between the two I's is actually indicating that pause. So Hawaii, there's two E sounds there, and there's a pause in between them. And similarly, one of the islands of Hawaii is Oahu. O-ahu, not Oahu, which would be a different word. I, um, I have no idea. So the we should say... 
the glottal stop is part of the international phonetic alphabet mm-hmm. because the international phonetic alphabet represents every sound that could be in a language. And the symbol for the glottal stop it looks a lot like our logo. We really like glottal stops. Oh, hey, it does. Yeah. I wonder where we got that idea. So it looks like a question mark without the dot, which is also our logo because we were trying to pick distinctive symbols. So I think we talked about it in one of the first episodes. We talked about where the logo was coming from. Probably, but I, it makes me realize I actually have no idea where the glottal stop symbol comes from. Well, so the glottal stop as a sound also has this kind of interestingly entangled history with the history of our own alphabet that we use in English. And so English alphabet comes from the Romans, which comes from the Greeks, but before the Greeks, it comes from the Phoenicians. Thanks Phoenicians. And the Phoenicians spoke <laughs> Thanks Phoenicians. You had some great ships and you had some great alphabet. And what's cool about Phoenician is Phoenician was a Semitic language. It's not spoken anymore, but modern Semitic languages include Arabic and Hebrew. And Semitic languages and Phoenicians no exception, for them consonants are super important and they don't really care that much about vowels. And so most of the Semitic languages don't bother writing vowels or they only write some of the vowels. So modern day Arabic and Hebrew do this, but also like ancient Phoenician did this as well. So Phoenician had this letter at the very beginning of the Phoenician alphabet, which was derived from an Egyptian hieroglyph which depicted an ox's head, mm-hmm. which was known as alip or alif. Yep. And this sound made the sound at the beginning of the word for ox's head, uh. which was alif. No, no, no. It's not ah, it's ah. the glottal stop, that bit of silence. See, because it's not a part of my language's sound system, I'm very bad at perceiving it. And it's really hard to hear at the beginning of a word because, of course, at the beginning of the word, what precedes a word is often just silence. Yeah. And it's really hard to hear the difference between silence and a glottal stop that's intended. I'm going to blame my own phonemic limitations rather than the quality of our video chat. <laughs> I think I think you can blame your brain for this one. Yeah. Because even when I try to produce it, I'm like, I'm just not doing anything. <laughs> but at the beginning of this aleph was this glottal stop. And Phoenician used this letter Aleph for the glottal stop. Mm. And then when the Phoenician alphabet was borrowed into Greek, they were like, well, A of all, we don't have a glottal stop in our language. And B of all, we do have all these vowels and they're pretty important for us. Uh, I'm really feeling the Greeks right now. I'm like, yeah, great. Yeah. They might have been like you, Lauren, and they might have been like, I can't even hear this sound, but do you know what I can hear? It's this other sound, yeah. this ah uh sound. <laughs> Let's just use this letter to write this ah uh sound that we have. But what's actually very interesting is that at a later period, Arabic underwent the same process where they started writing. So modern day Arabic alif is actually used for the ah uh sound. And there's just some kind of like weird historical writing quirk relics that make it sometimes also stand for this glottal stop sound. And modern day Arabic uses a different symbol, which is known as Hamza. And it looks kind of like a little C with an extra line on the bottom, but it's a tiny C. And that's used for the real glottal stop when you want to make sure that's what you're talking about. So if you have a word like mi a hundred in Arabic, that pause in the middle of mi a that's your glottal stop. And it's written with this Hamza instead. And Lauren, to come back to your question about where the IPA symbol comes from, which looks like this dotless question mark, that kind of C shape with the extra line is where the creators of the International Phonetic Alphabet got the idea to make some sort of C-ish type shape for the glottal stop in the IPA. Huh, I can kind of see it now. It's really nifty. (laughs) So that's really neat. So there's this hidden connection between IPA and between Arabic and the modern English alphabet, they kind of go around in a circle and they all influence each other. So far we've talked about nothingness that is still a sound. It's the the absence of sound, nothingness. But now we are moving into pure nothingness. We're not talking about sounds, we're talking about an absence of sound, but that still has a meaning behind it. This is getting really metaphysical. It is, but now we're going to go back and I'm going to give you an English grammar test. Are you ready? Okay, okay. So if I say the word cats, Mm -hmm. can you break the word cats or dogs down into meaningful units? Okay, so you have the cat unit, which refers to the animal, and you have the s unit, which refers to it, there being more than one of them. Okay, exactly what I wanted to hear. Okay. Great work. Yay! So we can break words down into (laughs) 
you passed the English grammar test. It was very <laughs> grueling. Um, so we can break words down into parts, and those parts have meaning. You don't see s floating around by itself. It always has to hang out with a noun to make more than one of that noun. Mm -hmm. But it has its meaning. Now, if I gave you the word cat or dog, mm -hmm. can you divide that down into meaningful parts? I mean, there's just the one. It, like, it still means the animal. Okay, so we can't divide that down anymore. It would be like splitting an atom. You'd be left with little atomic parts that don't have any meaning on their own. I mean, like, like k and a and t, but those are, those are sounds, and by themselves they don't do anything. Yeah. So if I said the cat on the wall, and this sounds like a trick question, but how many are there? On the wall? Um, there's one cat on the wall? Yep. And if I said the cat's on the wall, how many are there? There's more than one. Okay, so the... How are these cats getting on the wall? They're very agile cats, and it's a sunny <laughs> wall. Okay. Okay. Oh, that kind of wall, like an outdoor wall, not an indoor inside wall. Yeah. We'll have to have a talk about the semantic range of wall <laughs> after this episode. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I had a very interesting mental picture. <laughs> but back to the important bit, which is the bits of the word. Mm -hmm. So, sir means more than one. You know, though, if I don't use a sir, that I'm talking about one cat. Right. And there's nothing, you're not saying the one cat on the wall or one cat on the wall. There's nothing there that's telling you there's only one of them. It's just the fact it's that the I. The cat or the cats. It's the fact that I know that so is an option and you decided not to use that option. Yes. And I have to use that option. It's not like it's optional. If I'm talking about, I can't say the seven cat. That sounds silly. Right. So S. Or the one cats. <laughs> I mean, you, yeah, you can't use that without being ungrammatical in English. And so, sir right. has meaning, but the absence of it, the absence of the plural, also has meaning for English speakers. Right. And it has potentially different kinds of meaning depending on which kind of word has that absence. Yeah. So in terms of the plurals, it means it's not plural, it just means singular. But if I say something like, I like the cat versus I liked the cat, then now you have a difference between... Oh no, between... what did the cat do? I hope it didn't have a problem with the wall. <laughs> it destroyed my wall and I have a grudge. <laughs> um, so, you know, now, now I've changed like and liked. And so I've got this contrast between like plus the t sound, which is spelled E-D, but it's only pronounced t, and like without anything. And now the absence of anything means that it's present, not that it's singular. Yeah. So it's not that the absence always means exactly the same thing everywhere. In the way that cert doesn't, you know, she eats doesn't refer to the fact that it's a single person necessarily. It refers to the fact that it's a single third person present verb. Right. So just in the way that like cert or, or the cat's you know, pajamas can be a singular cat possessing the pajamas. Yeah. It could be possessive cert. So this nothingness doesn't have to mean the same thing everywhere, depending on the thing it's contrasting with. And we know that this is a particularly important feature of English because it's not true for all languages. So one language that I learned briefly in high school is Indonesian. And Indonesian is known, especially in kind of everyday informal language, for not marking plurals at all. Okay. Which is a thing that sounds strange to English speakers, but English does lots of things that sound strange to grammars of other languages. And so... I mean, I think, uh, yeah, other languages don't mark plurals as well. I can't think of any off the top of my head, but I'm sure there are some. Oh, there's plenty that don't mark plurals. It's just that when something is obligatory in your language, it's very hard to imagine other languages not paying it the same attention. Mm -hmm. And so in Indonesian, there's no zero absence that is important for contrasting the singular because the plural is not a thing that it contrasts with. It's kind of like there are a few words in English where this happens. So if you have like one deer or two deer, yeah, or like one sheep and two sheep, now sheep and deer don't have the absence meaning something because for those particular words, there's no difference between the singular and the plural. No. And we get by. Yeah. I mean, I don't personally talk about sheep a lot in my day-to-day -day life. But you could. <laughs> that just means you're not an insomniac because you're not counting sheep. Yeah. And so what counts as needing this kind of meaningful nothingness in one language may not necessarily need it in another language. And this is so prevalent across languages, this idea that 
not marking something has a meaning that it's called a zero morph and it actually has its own symbol. So it's the zero morpheme or the null morpheme and it gets a fancy symbol? It's the same symbol if you're a maths person as the empty set symbol or if you're a speaker of a Scandinavian language, it's like an O with a line through it. Yeah, so it's that symbol with a line through it, like an extra clarifying zero or empty set or null so one thing where the null morpheme really comes in handy is if you have something where in one language a particular set of meaning corresponds to a morpheme that's right there. So if you had a language where the singular got one marker and the plural got another marker and they were both very visible or audible, and then you wanted to kind of translate that or, you know, produce a version of it that was parallel in two different languages. And so you could say, well, this thing that is null in English actually corresponds to this particular morpheme in another language. It's very possible in English that we could have had an extra bit of a word that was like catten versus cats and in overtly marked a singular. Yeah, absolutely. We could totally have done that. And especially if you get languages where you have other kinds of markers, like gender markers or case markers on your nouns, then sometimes you have like a very broad system of... If you have something like in Latin, if you have catus versus cati... So catus is a singular cat, a nominative singular cat, and cati is a nominative plural cat. And so there your us and your e are both, uh, one's indicating singular and the other one's indicating plural. Yeah. Although I'll have to note that's the, that's the late Latin, vulgar Latin for cat, and the older classical Latin was <laughs> felinus, but that doesn't really matter at this point. <laughs> um, I was really interested in, like, whether this was some kind of new idea, because the the null set symbol has only been around since like the 1930s. So I had a look at kind of how long linguists have been talking about this kind of zero for. Have a have a guess, Gretchen. Wow, I I have no idea. So, I mean, it seems like something that's it's definitely always been part of my linguistics education that you have null morphemes. <laughs> Um, so it's definitely not in the past couple decade or two. Okay. Um, so let's, uh, I don't know, let's say like the 60s? A lot of stuff happened in linguistics in the 60s. Well, you're not two and a half thousand years old, so <laughs> you probably don't remember when Panini oh, started no. using it in his grammar of Sanskrit. You let um, me so, on by like, saying that this we, was we, from the 1930s. <laughs> Um, I did lead you on. It was very sneaky of me. It's very but, sneaky. Um, we haven't talked about Panini much on the show, but he's worth giving a shout out to because he wrote the first grammar of Sanskrit like over 2,000 years ago. And it's kind of been something that grammarians have constantly come back to as a model for how to analyze language. Is it the oldest grammar ever or just like one of the oldest grammars that we know about? It's ever? the oldest grammar that we know about in a proper grammatical tradition. So shout out to Panini for doing this. And he invented the null morpheme. What did he just, what did he say about them? He came up with the idea in his paradigm of Sanskrit verbs that the absence of a particular marking had had a meaning. Hmm. So good job, Panini. Good work, Kim. And the last case that I find super exciting about where nothing can mean something is that this is a case of a nothing that doesn't sound like anything, but it influences how other things around it sound. Oh, so we're no longer even talking about, we're talking about the way it affects other things. Excellent. But we know it's there because it affects the other things around it. So Lauren, I need a book title for an example sentence for you. What's a book you like? Okay. One of my favorite, like, languagey books that I like to read. Uh, I really like LMNOP. Oh my god, that's so good. I love that book. Okay. We're going to use LMNOP. It's Ella Minop, like the girl's name and the fish and the vegetable. It's a great book about language. You guys should totally read it. I think we've both written reviews about it, actually. I'm very fond of it. It's a kid's book, but it's compelling. It's like a young adult book. It's got chapters. So here's an example sentence. If I say, I want to read LMNOP. You are correct. <laughs> Perfectly good <laughs> sentence. I can also yeah. say, I want to read LMNOP. So I can say, want to or want to. Both of those are totally Excellent. reasonable sounding sentences. I can also say... I want all of our listeners to read Ella Minop. Agree. Still a good sentence. And then I could ask you, Lauren, who do you want to read Ella Minop? Everybody. Everybody. But then I could ask you, who do you want to read Ella Minop? Hang on, wait, 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 what? Who do I want to... Who, who do you want to read Ella Minop? Um, that sentence doesn't 
it's missing something. It's weird, right? It makes it sound like you're asking LMNOP who it wants to read, but it's a book it can't <laughs> read anything, Gretchen. Like, who do you want to read? Ella, Ella, who do you want to read? <laughs> right? Yeah. It doesn't make any sense. And it's really weird because we think of want to and wanna as meaning the exact same thing, right? Like, I, I want to read, I, I want to read, those are the same thing. Just one's more informal than the other. I would say there is there is no difference between them. It just seems like it's only a formality difference. That's it, right? But then when you get this other sentence, you're like, wait a second, it doesn't work. So let's break down what's in that sentence again. So we have the sentence, who do you want to read LMNOP? And the answer to that is, I want our listeners to read LMNOP. So there's something in the statement version of that, there's something in between the want and the to. And that's the, our listeners. Yeah. Whereas in, I want to read LMNOP, there's there's nothing in between there. I mean, you might be able to say, I want me to read LMNOP, but that's that's not really an English sentence. <laughs> no. So you could also ask the sentence as, you want who to read LMNOP? And again, there's the who. Yes. I mean, it sounds weird. I mean, it's... it's it relies on a certain pragmatic context. But I can answer It relies on a certain it. pragmatic context. But yeah. You could say... You want who to read LMNOP? That's okay. Yeah. When I unveil my plan for everybody to read it. <laughs> when you unveil your plan for world domination via literature. <laughs> <laughs> so there's this sense that there is something that logically belongs in between the want and the to in that second set of sentences and not in the first set. And that something could be listeners, could be who, could be you particularly, Lauren, like I want Lauren to read LMNOP. But there's nothing there, Gretchen. There's a sense that there's a word there. And yet, clearly there's not a word there because the who's actually at the beginning of the sentence. So there's nothing there, but that nothing, whatever that nothing is that's there, is preventing the want and the two from swooshing into each other. Wow. It's really weird. This is the most meaningfully nothingy nothing that we've got. Right? And so you can do this in all sorts of sentences. It generally requires a wanna, but you can say something like, who will I want to see? Who will I want to see? These are fine. Who will I want to go to the store? Who will I want to go to the store? No. You just change sentences halfway through. <laughs> who will I want to go to the store? <laughs> well, that's fine. <laughs> well, it's, it's, a, it's a restart, but who will I want to go to the store? It's just like, wait, it crashed. What happened? What did you do to me? <laughs> and that's a piece of evidence, and some theories of linguistics call this piece of nothing that's in between want and to, uh, call it a trace. Like the who, which you could put there, you could say you want who to read, yeah. but now you have who at the beginning, who do you want to read? The, the who that's at the beginning of the sentence left its trace in between want and to, and that's the thing that's preventing want and to from glomming into each other. And this is such a weird and interesting phenomenon that there are actually a couple different videos about this, so we can link to those as well if you want to see it demonstrated in front of you, if you want the visual. I think the visual does help. So we've gone from nothing and the absence of something between people speaking. We've gone to the absence of sound as a sound. We've gone to the absence of a part of a word as a meaningful part of a word. And we've ended up with the absence of something in a sentence appearing to make a sentence have a different meaning. Yeah, there's all these things that nothing really does mean something as long as you control the context and the something very, very carefully. For more Lingthusiasm and links to everything mentioned in this episode, go to lingthusiasm.com. You can listen to us on Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Google Podcasts, or Google Play Music, SoundCloud, or wherever else you get your podcasts. And you can follow at Lingthusiasm on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and Tumblr. You can get IPA scarves and other Lingthusiasm merch at lingthusiasm.com slash merch. I can be found as at Gretchen A. McSee on Twitter. My blog is allthingslinguistic.com. I tweet and blog as Superlinguo. To listen to bonus episodes, ask us your linguistic questions, and help keep the show ad-free, go to patreon.com slash lingthusiasm or follow the links from our website. Recent bonus topics include forensic linguistics, navigating linguistics grad school, homonyms, and an inside view of gesture and emoji conferences. And you can help us pick the next topic by becoming a patron. If you can't afford to pledge, that's also okay. We really appreciate it if you could rate us or leave a review on iTunes or recommend Lingthusiasm to anyone who needs a little more linguistics in their life. 
Lingthusiasm is created and produced by Gretchen McCulloch and Lauren Gaughan. Our audio producer is Claire Gaughan, our editorial producers are Emily Graff and A.E. Prevo, and our production assistants are Celine Yoon and Fabienne Anderberg. And our music is by The Triangles. Stay Lingthusiastic! Lingthusiastic!